everyone, and welcome to Paizo Live, our monthly fireside chat show where we talk to our wonderful creatives about all the cool things they have coming. My name is Rue Dickey. I use they, he, or z pronouns, and I'm Paizo's marketing and media specialist. Hi, my name is BJ Hensley. I'm the director of marketing here at Paizo. My pronouns are pretty much whatever you want to use. They, them, she, he, sir, answer to that. Um, excited to be here today, and uh, we're going to be talking to James Jacobs about Curtain Call and Thirsty Hillman about Empires Devoured and Mike Sayer about War of Immortal. Oh, I cannot believe you have it physically. <laughs> no, I have it. I have the, I have the, all the copies oh. of the thing. Now, usually we ask what folks have been playing recently, um, but because of some things that were re revealed this week, I'm going to cheat the system a little bit and ask you a very pointed question. Uh -oh. um, do you have, oh, I've just realized, I'll have to grab the picture of it, but do you have any favorite licensed partner products? Oh, yes, yes, I do. So everybody loves spooky season and uh, we're coming up on October and we're happy to announce that not this year, but next October, we're going to have our very own Gord Leshy. And if you're not sure what that is, it looks like an, ah, oh, here it is. It's an adorable little pumpkin friend that I... WizKid has been kind enough to create. So if you're a fan of those really neat foam statues, um, like this, like this the one kobold. over here. Yeah. yeah, my kobold over there guarding the office. They, they work in HR, you gotta be careful. Um, this is a great opportunity for you because with kids is going to be coming out with the most adorable one of these yet i'm pretty sure i'm and so... if you want to grab one this year instead of the cute little pumpkin there is a baby goblin they've got going on right now that you can get your hands on for pre-order and that'll yeah. be awesome this year this okay. one is the same size as the baby goblin and i have not seen the baby goblin yet but i know it is like essentially mm -hmm. cat sized yes they're um... super cute <laughs> So I cannot wait until I can get my hands on that one and the Gord Leshy. Cryptic Walker says they're jealous about my War of Immortals copy. If it makes you feel better, most of Paizo staff are as well. I'm just a very, very lucky human. <laughs> BJ gets to have them so that they can take really pretty pictures for us. I do my best. Now, usually also we do this on the first Friday of the month, um, but last week was a holiday. And also I felt that we needed to take advantage of it being Friday the 13th, right before spooky season. Um, and so my fun fact for today is going to be uh, my favorite superstition. And if you'd like to share superstitions with us in the chat, I'll read them in between questions when we get to the Q&A portion later. Um, but my favorite superstition is actually really on theme with our Gord Leshy because in Romani folklore, uh, vampire pumpkins are a thing. Uh, so if you leave your pumpkin out like past Halloween for a full month, it becomes a vampire pumpkin and it will roll around and haunt you until you properly like bury it and get rid of it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, as somebody who has definitely left pumpkins out past their prime, I can tell you uh, something horrific happens there. I don't know that I have a lot of superstitions. Um, I, I think uh, I have superstitions regarding my dice. I don't like other people to touch them. I have a lot of really beautiful dice and I, uh, I prefer not to share them. So it's very hard for me to share them even though I have hundreds of dice and I, and I have this, this strange superstition that if somebody else rolls them, they'll never roll well for me again. I think I have the opposite problem where my dice, some sets don't like me and then I'll hand them to somebody else and they'll roll exclusively 20s. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I have a child with that problem. His whole entire life, he just rolls like ones way more often than anybody I've ever seen. It's so sad. And someone will pick up his dice and roll them and they'll roll like a 20. And we're just, we keep buying him dice and it never changes. I, he's dice cursed. It's terrible. Oh, well, as we are getting started, we're going to bring James on. And remember, everyone, ask your questions in the chat. I'm pointing to the chat as if you can see it physically. Um, but ask them there. We'll gather them and ask them to our creatives at the end. And I will be taking you to speak with James in just a second. Welcome, James. Hi. <laughs> Fancy new graphics and everything. Yeah, how are you doing today? Pretty good, pretty good. I know you mentioned Friday the thirteenth, uh, so I'm I'm delighted that it's that to be here on the internet on such a lucky occasion. 
Yeah, I was going to say, uh, both of us are really big horror movie buffs. So I wanted to ask if you had any like Friday the 13th movie traditions or like anything else that you really love about Spooky Day. Not really, because I mean, for me, that's kind of every day. I'm, I'm usually watching a horror movie or playing some sort of reading horror novels or something like that. Tonight, I'm probably going to be going to watch. There's an episode of Joe Bob that I haven't yet seen about Galaxy of Terror, which is this old Roger Corman kind of alien ripoff movie that I'm delighted about. I was thinking of renting Friday the 13th Part 2 and watching that because that's the first one in the series that I saw. And uh, I remember seeing the trailer as a kid at some kid's movie at the movie theater in my small town of Point Arena got letters to the editor for showing Friday the 13th Part 2 in front of, uh, I don't know what it was. It was like Bambi or, or Snow White or something like that. Maybe not, not the movie. <laughs> not that movies where mothers get shot dead by hunters or, or evil queens rip out the hearts of, uh, of uh, wayward orphans or whatever aren't horror. That's fair. I... I don't know if I should talk because my dad had a very like strong like things that my kid can and can't watch as a child and he was like yes my eight-year-old can absolutely watch Alien it will not scare them it will not leave mm. them looking behind them at all times yeah it's it's educational you know yeah you know <laughs> all right well passing up the uh very fun Friday the 13th um, things. We're going to talk about Curtain Call, which is mm. a adventure path that I have uh, some very deep love in my heart for as a theater kid. Um, before we get into questions, in case folks haven't seen any of the Curtain Call volumes that have come out so far, can you give us like the elevator pitch for Curtain Call? Yeah, it's, it's basically, it's a high level adventure path uh, starting at 11th level. And the basic conceit of it is that during your first through 10th level, careers as adventurers you got up to shenanigans you went on adventures you made a name for yourselves and uh became heroes you did something worthy of having stories told and pretty soon into the curtain call you are contacted by a famous director who wants to turn those adventures into an opera and asks you to come help produce this opera for them so the adventure path is is mostly a uh, sort of a whimsical kind of putting on an opera and all of the shenanigans that that, in, that uh, come out of that. But it's also for Pathfinder, which has, you know, fighting stuff going on. So there's this subplot uh, happening of a dark and mysterious sinister force that has issues and plans for the region that you as big heroes have to kind of take care of. So you're, you're balancing on the one hand, making sure that all of the uh, the actors are hitting their marks and getting somebody to to do the special effects and the comp compositions and double checking all of the, the the scenes and all that and going out to fight monsters and and get treasures. I have to ask when you were originally like pitching this and like getting the outlines made. Um, also, this will come into play. This. Adventure Path is tangentially related to the War of Immortals and the God's Reign, which is our yeah. current meta event. When you originally pitched this, was that part of the core concept or did that sort of get added in as we realized when it would happen in the timeline? Uh, not when I, as, as a narrative, crea narrative creative director uh, for the uh, for Pathfinder, I've got all of these different ideas bumping around my head for upcoming Adventure Paths. And I'd wanted for a long time to do a high level sort of whimsical, uh, lighthearted adventure path. I've done plenty of horror stuff before, yeah, but I also really enjoy just the comedy and whimsy and stuff like that. And I think that's even harder to pull off than horror. And so I wanted to kind of challenge myself to do an adventure path where it's it's lighthearted and whimsical and something funny is going on. And I had this kind of proto idea that it would be high as well. And the idea was that you would be bun a bunch of player characters who have to travel to Elysium or somewhere in the great beyond and put on a play or opera or some sort of performance for the gods. And you had to do this in a way that convinced them to do something or to not do something. And you would have to go around gathering resources from all these other, so it was sort of a, a more of a plane hopping type adventure path as well. And then when the, the plot to, there's gonna be a slight amount of spoilers going on, but the plot against Gorham started manifesting with War of Immortals. Uh, it made sense that this storyline where you would be performing 
essentially in front that the gods would be watching what you're doing. This would be a great place to tie that in. So the opera side of things kind of remains the same. You're still high level characters putting on a show, but you're no longer really doing it for the gods. You're doing it in the city of Ravenel uh, or the city of Cantargo in Ravenel. And uh, the sort of God's reign adjacent content happens in the wings, in the after hours. And it eventually kind of comes together into a climactic scene that I'm not going to say when the events of uh, God's reign happen, but they do happen during the adventure battle. Very cool. And my next question is that uh, because this is designed to be a sequel to an existing campaign, uh, like grade mm -hmm. one through 10, when you were going through and doing the art orders, how did you sort of decide what to reference in making those so that you wouldn't just be sort of having to make something up wholesale? Yeah, that was a tricky thing that I kind of fell back to just the way we do our iconics in the first place. I mean, people love, you know, Mauricio's my favorite about like Kira and Valros and everybody is, they've, they've taken on lives of their own, but they were originally created as stand-ins. Whenever we wanted to illustrate a picture of a fight and adventure, we don't know what your rogue looks like, but we know what our rogue looks like. So we'd use our iconics as stand-ins for that. And I realized we have plenty of adventures out there already that go from first to 10th level that could stand in in the same way. So while in anyone's home game at, of a Curtain Call, you could be doing this adventure path after pretty much anything, whether it's something you made up on your own or a published adventure from Paizo or an adventure from whatever. Um, I ended up choosing Abomination Vaults. And uh, here we see Lem on stage giving an RA or something like that while either an actress or actor or special effects or something in the background is playing Belcora, who is the main villain of Abomination Vaults. And you'll see that uh, got the gauntlet itself is looming in the background as part of the set design and all of that. So whenever we had to show something going on on stage or otherwise associated with whatever opera was going on, we would default to Abomination Vaults as that uh, indication. And uh, to a certain extent as well, because we wanted to build upon like, some of the villains that you fought in whatever you played before play echoing roles in here, either as like villains on stage or other stuff that uh, we'll get into when she's are playing. So we needed to, to use our an iconic villain from that too. And Bill Cora is a pretty awesome looking ghosty lady. So it's a handy, handy thing there. I, I also chose a box of results because that's one I, at this point, I think the most people have played it's, it's, readily available in hardcover. It's it segues directly from the beginner box. So it's pretty popular. I really love, like, you said, you just said it could be an actor or someone in special effects. And it had not occurred to me that that might be an actor just in, like, a lot of ghostly face paint behind Lem. I've mm -hmm. just always been assuming he conjured up an illusion. But the world mm -hmm. of theater is vast. Uh, that it you is. Mentioned you mentioned that this is sort of a, a, a an adventure that splits between those very whimsical theatrical elements and then the more serious ones. So what would you say was like the balance between those and how difficult was it to sort of strike that balance for this? Um, it was, it was not bad. I mean, I had some great uh, authors working on it. Uh, but one of the main things I wanted to do when I created the outline for this adventure path is, is I laid out certain areas and each volume where there basically would be very little, if not no combat going on for an entire section. There's going to be entire chapters of this adventure path, which translates entire character levels where you never roll initiative. Um, and you're going to be earning experience by uh, attending soirees or tracking down, um, you know, missing actors or uh, trying to deal with scandals. You know, inevitably there's a scandal that pops up and, um, yeah, I mean, that's basically, even even when you are going off to fight things, combat's not always going to be the best solution, you know? There's going to be a situation where maybe there's a dinosaur in the jungle, and you could attack and kill it, but it might be a better idea to just kind of make friends with it. Maybe it's hungry. Maybe you need to bring it a nice, delicious fish for it to uh, sup upon. And if you do that, the dinosaur might feel a little less angry at you and more inclined to maybe chase off the, the creepy fae that are lurking in the, the woods around you or something like that. So yeah, it's, it really leans into the idea of um, solving complex uh, like combat situations with, with, you know, diplomacy or intimidation or deception or performance. A lot of skill type of solutions are going on in this adventure path. Um, 
they're they're tough. You you it's it's going to be just it's going to be pretty easy to like roll bad on a performance check, and then suddenly they're not throwing tomatoes at you; they're throwing darts and bombs. So. <laughs> it's got to be dangerous to be an actor. <laughs> well, yeah, in the you, Opera House, especially if you're high level, you know. The, customers and patrons take off the gloves <laughs> i don't i don't know anywhere where it would be necessarily safe to do a theatrical show in galarian but now i'm worried for every performer in, yeah, in the entire yeah. world so something that i'm really excited about and i will also disclose here that i worked on the first volume of curtain call um is the operatic elements and how we've uh sort of incorporated them throughout and I wanted to talk to you about how, like, how did you decide in the outlining stage which parts of the casting and the production would go into which volume, as opposed to, like, maybe putting it all in the last volume or something like that? So one thing I really took to heart was a lot of the feedback people gave us for Extinction Curse, which was what our second uh, edition, our second second edition adventure path, I think. Mm -hmm. It was in the before times. Um, but in that adventure, kind of the hook was that you were circus performers putting, you know, taking your show on the road and doing performances all over the place. And as that adventure path went on, the circus performing stuff kind of went to the background and you started doing more, you know, high adventure type content. People were uh, frustrated with that fact. And it, I really wanted, even though this one's half the length of Extinction Curse, this is a three part adventure path, I wanted the opera and all of that element to be front and center in each adventure. So when I was creating the outline, I kind of, we, we had split into three books and I decided, well, well, there's three elements of, of putting on a show. The first one is when you're basically coming up with the concept and getting it um, uh, sponsored and making sure that you're gonna have financed and all of that, making sure you have the resources and everything to actually go forward with it. So the first adventure, that's basically what's going on. The player characters are contacted by the director who asks them, they, they're going to have to do like a, a preliminary audition themselves to show her that they are actually real and the stories about them aren't fake. But then it, it kind of segues into like, they, they're going to have to do the, you know, this, the route of going around uh, the Kentargo and securing financing and, and, and getting their names out there and all of that stuff. And then once uh, they've accomplished that, uh, then they can responsibly start working on the actual opera. So that's a, that's the second adventure, and that is when you're like you're hiring the actors and actresses, where you're uh, seeking out like the composition or the composer and the orchestra, um, helping to write it, doing all sorts of stuff like that, and getting everything going, and then starting to actually, you know, do rehearsals and all of that. And then the last volume is basically is Hell Month, which is kind of an extension of Hell Week. Uh, that is the it's time a right long? before. Yeah. <gasps> so it's a month long session of, of harrowing shenanigans that happen before your premiere. So you have to do all of these last minute disasters that basically hit you. And then you put on the show. And the putting on the show itself is a significant part of that adventure. It's, it's, it's handled sort of like a chase sequence where you're doing a bunch of different checks and all of that. One thing I do want to mention uh, for sure um, uh, to just kind of manage expectations is the ex the player characters aren't going to be playing themselves on stage. That's something I wanted to, to make sure wasn't, because if you're an actor on, in a, a production, you got to be there all the time. You're doing a lot of the, the rehearsals and all that. There's not a lot of time left over to go adventuring. But if you're a producer, you know, you just shell out the money now and then, solve problems, but then you go off and gallivant, in this case, go on adventures. So the player characters are focusing on uh, being producers for this whole uh, whole time. And one of the side effects of that is, um, well, they're going to have a lot of actors to choose from that are going to play them. And I think, we, yeah, we got the, here's uh, this, this, you wrote this, right, Rue? I did. These <laughs> are all of my babies. Game of plug. <laughs> so, yeah, I, was, I, I love working with you on this one. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, ask you to create eight actors, make them all sorts of ancestries and diverse characters and all of that. We don't know what pair of characters you're going to make. Uh, so we basically threw together a super wide range of, you know, dwarves and elves and uh, monkey goblin even in there. And, um, uh, then your player characters are going to have to interview these eight actors and pick which, and, you know, if you got four players, you got to pick four actresses, actors and all of that or whatever. And, um, 
you got to pick the ones you think will do the best job at playing you on the stage. And of course, you're going to need, you know, there's going to be special effects and makeup and all that stuff. Um, or, or maybe, you know, you're a, if you were, if your character is a, a, you know, a whimsical elf, maybe the dwarf, you got you hire the dwarf to play that character and it's, it's a scandal or whatever you want to do. All sorts of different options going on there. Um, of course, these actors all need like, you know, coddling and uh, support <laughs> and sometimes they're going to get into trouble, etc. So that's just another element of, of uh, stuff that's going on. The main villain, whoever plays Bill Cora or whoever your main villain is in this thing, is not one of these actors. Uh, they are a different NPC out there that the director's like, I want to get, basically, this is the Marlon Brando or the Kate Blanche, the, oh. the huge, like, the huge actor or actress out there who has made a huge name, but then went into retirement and nobody knows where they went. So you got to find them to play the villain. And then once you find them, you got to convince them to play the villain. So, <laughs> Oh, I am imagining a prima donna from Phantom of the Opera style. Like you have mm -hmm. to shower this person with gifts to get them to come out of hiding. <laughs> yep. 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 You have to basically prove to them that it's worth still acting, that there's still something left for them to do. <laughs> um, I will leave the questions about my children for the end in the Q and a, and then I will bring the picture <laughs> back up for all of you. <laughs> People are asking about them in the chat. Um, but I will say that when I was working on those, one of the most fun things was that because you have to pick who's the best one to portray you. And uh, James and Vanessa had these like descriptors for each of the actors. And mm, so I made right. my... I made myself a uh, one of those flow charts that like connects names to each other so I could remember which actors had which traits. And then I turned it over as part of my milestone. And Vanessa was like, what is this web of words? <laughs> yeah, it was like a total red string all over the yeah. wall. Yeah. <laughs> but it was it was brilliant. I mean, one of the things we wanted to at the very at the start of this was to isolate eight personas that are, you know, your personalities that you bring to the show. And the player characters each pick one of these. When you're making your character, you can be brave, or you can be the flirt, or you can be the underdog, or you can be the guardian. Or There's eight of them. There's eight of those actors. And each one of them epitomizes one of those traits. And uh, as you play through Curtain Call, there will be certain encounters, certain areas where if you are the flirt, your character is going to do extra good at this encounter. Or if you're the underdog, maybe this encounter is going to be extra tough for you. So, And then... Also, like if you get the underdog to play you and you are the, the leader, maybe that's a, a complicated, you know, clashing element. That actor might have a lot of trouble playing you. So it's just a really interesting sort of way to set things up. Also explore the idea like whoever your character is in real life doesn't necessarily mean who they are on screen. You know, like Vincent Price is was a nice guy, but a lot of his movies, you know, you watch... Uh, you know, uh, Mask of the Red Death, he's not a nice guy. <laughs> I feel like a lot of, like, classical horror actors, like, are really good at playing scary, horrible people. Oh, yeah. And then they've yeah. got 12 cats and they uh, love yeah. to make tea. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins is a great example, uh, more modern, you know. I mean, he's famous for playing Hannibal Lecter, but he's probably not a cannibal in real life. <laughs> probably. Yeah, you can never say for sure. Um, we're almost out of time for this segment, but I did want to ask if you had a spoiler for us. I do, I do. Um, it's sort of, I mean, Curtain Call's already out. People are already getting the third adventure and are, are finding out a lot of the deep secrets. So this is a little bit of a spoiler, but not so much. And when you get the cover to the last volume, you'll see this guy on the cover. That is Nagorber, the god of greed, murder, secrets, and uh, uh, poison. Uh, he's not on the cover because of idle reasons. You spend a significant portion of this adventure path dealing with Nagorber's cult, dealing with worshippers of Nagorber. And there's something he's up to associated with, uh, you know, the events of Wrath of the Mortals and all of that. And uh, uh, you will, I guess this is this is my spoiler. Um, we've already revealed, like in 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 chat and in, in on the uh, message boards, that we you do get to learn who Nag what Nagorber's name is. I'm not going to mention it here, um, but that spoiler, I guess, would be at some point during the adventure, you spend a significant amount of time hanging out with him in person. That's very and that is cool. that is the extreme version of everything you've been doing up till now, where you're solving problems not through combat. Use what you've learned. 
because Nagorber doesn't have a stab block. If you fight Nagorber, he gets to pick his numbers, basically. I critically hit you for 11 points of damage, and your soul gets cut off. He can do that if he wants. So, yeah, don't roll an initiative against Nagorber. <laughs> there, there was there was a significant uh, uh, San HHS wrote the last adventure and, and created just a lot of amazing content for it. Uh, there was a sub system for if you wanted to flirt with Nagorber, and uh, I ended up having to cut it because uh, it was a lot of room, and it really didn't mesh with the vibe of Nagorber going on. You can still you know try that sort of thing, but he's not a He's not a cuddly guy. <laughs> well, there go my hopes. For, but that's for what Curtin that's Hall. what your GM is there for. If you have if you have a character who wants to roll to seduce Nagorber, you know you could you could try that. Um, people want to talk about it online. I'm, I'm already there to answer on the forums and all. That. Anyway, Nagorber Nagorber shows up. He's not awesome. the only god that shows up either. Okay, I'll stop talking now. Oh. Dropping a second spoiler to surprise me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, James. And we will see you back at the end for our Q&A. So remember, folks, if you have questions about Curtain Call, feel free to drop them in the chat throughout. We'll grab them towards the end for the Q&A. We're going to go to a couple of quick ads. And then BJ will be here to talk to Thurston about Starfinder Playtest. Bye. The year is 324 AG, and Daimelko is at war with itself. The Colossi took everything from us. They raised our cities and trampled our world into dust. Oceans boiled and the ground quaked with their footsteps. Millions perished. The survivors fled underground to hide like the prey they were. Then we learned to fight back. We built war machines from the wreckage of our shattered past. We called them Valkos. The brave souls who piloted them were the Huskars. They fought for a new home in this broken world at great cost. That was 200 years ago. Now we still defend New Valor against the Colossi that would destroy it. Some say we're winning. Our tech is getting better. New allies from across the galaxy join our fight every day. But if we can adapt, the monsters can too. We survived the apocalypse once, and we can do it again. My name's Commander Vadian Wayno, call sign Raptor. I've been fighting this war for a long time, but I can't do it alone. That's why the new Valor Defense Force needs you to suit up and fight back against the Colossi. I won't lie to you, they're bigger, faster, and sometimes I even wonder if they're smarter than us. But with your help, we can beat them and take our planet back for good. Think you have what it takes to be a Huskar? Join me. Together we can take Daimalco back from the monsters. For us, it's the rebirth of our homeworld. For them, it's Mechageddon. For the stars, the Starfinder 2nd Edition Play Test brings Starfinder into a bright future of cross-game compatibility and intergalactic intrigue. The Starfinder 2nd Edition Play Test Rulebook gives players and GMs a wealth of science fantasy character options, spells, feats, equipment, and more. The Playtest Rulebook outlines 10 ancestries and, of course, adorable Skittermanders. Choose from six classic, the charismatic envoy, a magical mystic, the stealthy operative, the heavy hitting soldier, and the cosmic powered solarion, and the paradoxical witch warper. Launch into the play test with the first play test adventure, a cosmic birthday. An adventure for first level characters, a Cosmic Birthday places characters at the center of a world-changing event in the Starfinder universe. Witness the birth of a new god, battle cosmic horrors in space, and make it back to the party in time! Excited for higher level play? 
dive into the center of blossoming intergalactic conflict in Empires Devoured. Empires Devoured is an adventure for 10th level characters. Characters find themselves on Atuity, witnessing a historic peace talk between Aslanti, Star Empire, and the Vescarium. However, that brokered peace is shattered by a surprise attack and negotiations turn into interstellar war. Fighting against rogue Aslanti operatives, saboteurs, and devourer cultists, the characters must stop the conflict from destroying Atuiti and the entire Adelawe star system. Launch into the science fantasy campaign of your dreams with the Starfinder 2nd Edition Play Test. I can't hear you, Thirsty. Oh, that would help if I press my mute button on my mic. I was jamming out to the music. I didn't want anyone to hear me. It was good music. There. <laughs> it was a pretty cool trailer, you got to admit. It was. It well, was. Welcome back. And uh, we're here to talk a little bit about Starfinder Playtest. We just launched it at Gen Con. It was super exciting, right? Yeah, that was eight years ago. That was a long time it, ago. It, it does seem like a bit like... of an eternity. But you know what? I think it's only been like a month. So so tell oh. us how that year-long oh. month has been going. Only, what's only what's month, going oh. uh, actually, what's, what's it's popular? It's it's been um it's been really good so far. I, I guess I should start by thanking everyone who's participated so far. The just the involvement, the the feedback. Um it's it's just blown us away. It's been really good. Uh, team in fact had some meetings today starting to really deep dive some of the initial feedback we've had. Obviously, we've been doing that for a while, but we're reading we're reaching some points of uh, what we call statistical uh, relevance, or at least enough where we can start diving in and getting get seeing some trends and getting some broader information from everyone who's participated in the surveys that's been amazing um yeah the 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 whole process has been really stunning to see so far uh we're really excited because we're getting more content out there with some of our uh playtest scenarios and then something we're going to talk about a bit more in this empires devoured um that kind of brings us into part two of the playtest uh yeah so it's a really exciting time uh the team has just, yeah look at that book oh, it's so cool it's so neat it's awesome. I love it. It's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book. What do you think is the most popular thing about Playtest right now? Like, what are people really loving? Ooh, ooh. Um, so I think, you know, without putting too fine of a point on it, I think compatibility. Everyone is really yeah. enjoying the ability to take a Starfinder component and put it in their Pathfinder games, or conversely, taking stuff that exists in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition engine, bringing it into their Starfinder games. That often yeah. opens up a wealth of opportunities that's really been the biggest excitement we've seen is that people who have large libraries of books feels that those you know libraries are valid and in fact add on to the game whereas starfinder can still stand on its own so that that has been i think one of the things people have really enjoyed about about it and we're we're seeing that through survey data and we're seeing that through people who've completed um you know games and posted online we're, we're actually seeing a lot of really positive feedback about that and just how things work together that's that I think is the biggest point for us. I know it's huge for me. I am incredibly excited to be able to bring uh, Pathfinder into my Starfinder game or sometimes Starfinder into my Pathfinder game. I mean, who doesn't want to be abducted by aliens, right? You, right? you can do that now. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we talked a little bit about Empires uh, Devoured, or at least we mentioned it just a moment ago. It releases next month. <gasps> yes. Yes. Very exciting. It's coming up. It's coming up. Um, well, as the author on it, you. Uh, can you tell us uh, what should we be expecting? What should players and GMs expect like heading into this book? What's something we can get excited about? Yeah, so uh, as you can see right there, right up at the top, it says Playtest Adventure 2. So this is our second yeah. Playtest Adventure. Um, it takes place in a bit of a higher level range. Uh, one of the things we are noticing with our playtest data right now, which is totally anticipated, is we're sort of skewing on the lower level range. As people pick up the playtest, they make new characters, they're testing things out. A lot of the content we've released has been lower level. Empire's Powered uh, kind of kicks that up. Uh, it's an adventure that starts off at 10th level and gets to about 13. 14 by the end of it oh, wow. um so it picks up it's got a very you know 
fairly high mid to high level pace there um i think most people who play um you know one to 20 games realize that let's let's be honest 13th level is probably high level for most gaming groups at home um <laughs> but it gives us the opportunity to really dive into some of those areas where you know the sweet spot of campaigns that sort of mid into high level area so i'm really excited about that but i think the biggest thing about empires devoured that personally excites me is it's pushing forward the narrative for starfinder second edition oh okay um, just starfinder in general um this is a adventure that kicks off a major event in the setting uh particularly something we've hinted at and maybe poked around the edges but we uh we start off an interstellar war between two of our big powers the <gasps> vascarium and the vesk and the aslanti star empire they're sort of two of our bigger civilizations that are not the main civilization of the pack worlds that we sort of focus on so we kind of set up this backdrop of war and that all starts in this adventure wow i gotta find time to read this <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that sounds very very entertaining um so so how did the starfinder team decide which big canon events to use as adventures in this sort of transitionary period between editions because we're going from starfinder first edition to second edition like how was that decision made yeah so one of the uh one of the things that we started with um when we were going into a new edition was we actually had a lot of team meetings that really focused on narrative. And we sort of started, all right, let's go through every packed world, every core element of our setting and like review it, go over cool things that exist there, things maybe we want to shave off or adjust or won't work in a new edition or a new dynamic. We went through all of these and it was a pretty rigorous and honestly fun <laughs> process. Like I, the team just jumped on things. It's how some something you saw in Cosmic Birthday, the first playtest adventure, where we're like, "How about one of these planets just hatches? That's cool." Oh, it's so good! Uh, yeah, though. it's right? so good. If you haven't um, checked it out, you should check out Cosmic Birthday. It was oh, yeah. amazing. It, and and that was sort of the like, we we started getting these like discussion points of, well, what if we did this? What if we did this other thing? Um, and so those were were points that really pushed us forward. I would say. Um, and so when we got, when we finished the pack worlds, then we went out to near space, then the vast, and we went through all these other civilizations and areas we have in the setting. And we got to, you know, the Vescarium and the Aslanti, the Vescarium ostensibly a, an ally of sorts, but also has a lot of, eh, we'll say problematic tendencies. And then we have um, the Aslanti Star Empire, which is, you know, capital P for punch in the face, bad guys. <laughs> so we thought, what if we have these two forces start, start going at it in a way that lets players get themselves involved in a science fiction, science fantasy staple, you know, interstellar war, interstellar war. But, <laughs> but does not need to be the defining thing of the setting like our main area of the pack worlds is not involved in this war but the pcs find themselves in empires devoured there at the start of this conflict and they kind of are the eve of peace that turns into the start of war i think we have a another our first art piece here if, if you kind of can bring that up um um, yeah, you'll you'll see here some of the examples of what they might find themselves getting into. This one is actually a really fun encounter. Um, this is a complex hazard. You'll see me spouting Ooh. my love of the complex hazard rules design here, where um, the the piece also spoilers, minor spoilers. So you know, bear with. Um, but uh, here, the PCs have to rescue a pilot of a crashed Vescarium fighter craft. Um, and they only have so long before that crashed ship explodes. And so oh, it's a race oh no. against time. And you can see here the picture of our iconic Navasi uh, attempting to save the cherry red skittermander named Runkle Gigi, who has some important information. Uh, this is this is all something that you get to do in the adventure and your characters all get to kind of contribute and help out to, to try to do. And it's an example right. of how we can take a mechanic, like a core concept in Pathfinder, the complex hazard, and really sci-fi it up that's really cool that that is a lot of fun so before i ask you if there's anything else you'd like to tell us about empires devoured have you had a chance to think about your superstitions do you have any superstitions you'd like to share with us you and i shared superstitions at the very beginning there do you have one that sticks with you or if you don't you could just tell us what cool games you've been playing lately i can definitely tell you what cool games i'm playing um superstitions you know i 
I am not a very superstitious person, believe it or not. I love like horror and spooky stuff, but I'm not like myself superstitious. I I view it with with clinical detachment and love all yeah. of it because I think they're neat. Um, you know, I recently I will say, uh, you know, my partner and I we acquired a a kitten, a a perfectly Aww. void black cat, and none of those superstitions are true. Our void black cat not. is a blessing to our house. That's a hundred percent true. Yeah, cats are definitely a blessing, not a curse. I agree. But well, what about games? What's the most? What's the coolest game you've been playing lately? Oh gosh, well I um. I'm we all know it's Starfinder, but I mean outside out, of our outside game. of tabletop. Well, then <laughs> good call, good call. And and Warhammer, everyone knows I play Warhammer. Uh, no, I'm actually um. Right now, I've got a slight side wow addiction. That's kind of my, you know, back to the back to the old world of Warcraft. That's kind nice. of my happy place. But I would say, um, gonna go with my 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 favorite RPG series. This had a new game recently released, The Legend of Heroes. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the, I don't the, think I am. it'll it'll take you on a journey. It's a very uh, well storied JRPG, um, and the latest one, Trails Through Daybreak, uh, just got translated into English. So my partner and I. Ooh that and it is glorious and you should all play those games if you can i kind of hold them at a high point of like narrative stuff so that's the game i'll have to look those up i'm a little bit buried in the new space marines game though so fair fair that's next that's yeah. oh it's good you, sh you should definitely play it. it's oh. very good all right well we're about out of time here did you <gasps> look at that art piece oh. Oh. we gotta talk about this <laughs> did we forget to talk about an art piece Oh, I know, I know, I know. We just kind of, we kind of, we kind of just like, it, I, I forgot to mention this. This is another great encounter that takes place where um, you maybe fight some, I don't know, demonic flesh brutes with guns. Like we're, we, we have interstellar war, but there is still some fantastical elements that you will see in here. Here is uh, our Witch Warper Zamir and our mystic Chick Chick oh. battling against some of these threats. And Chick Chick we will... is pretty cool. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Especially uh, this is the older playtest art, but just wait, some of the uh, some of the new art we've had uh, going on. I believe there's also one more art piece we can probably show. One more art piece, Ooh. right? We can do that. We can do that. Yeah. Uh, um, tell us about here, this. This one looks really cool. Yeah, here we can see some of the allies the PCs are going to uh, work alongside as part of this. Here we see uh, Commander Iron and Vasoya, who people might recognize from the the settlement of Atuity. That was first talked about in Ports of Call and then in Drift Crisis. We're really building on some older Starfinder lore, but presenting it in a way that people can just kind of come in and meet some of these characters. So we're really excited. You can also see there that that, as, that, that uh, little Aslanti guy on the right uh, has purple armor and uh, a different symbol than the Aslanti typically have. We'll learn more about them in the future. They're called the Sahedron Aww. Guard, and they're pretty cool. Um, that looks pretty cool. But I, I think I think if we are running out of time, is it do I have to do I have to give a spoiler? Is that it? Do I have to? Well, I mean, you don't have to, but we won't say no if you have one to share. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm gonna, you know, everyone's been so great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a spoiler. So I mentioned earlier we were having a meeting about the playtest today, and something uh, we actually went through a fair amount of feedback on the Envoy class, which has been really well received. A lot of people really like the directions we've gone with the Envoy, but. As part of the playtest, we want to make sure we're doing things right. And one of the things we saw uh, from the Envoy class is a lot of people really like the concept of the directives where you kind of issue an order and then you can follow through on it. And that's a big part of the class. Um, but they felt they didn't have enough directives. Um, and there was another piece of feedback we had that was, wow, there are these leadership styles and they're super cool. But... I don't feel they're adding enough to the class to, you know, really make it feel distinct. So uh, we've made the the decision to, uh, and, and in fact, we've, we've got them in there. Uh, all of the leadership styles uh, for the final version of the Envoy will have their own bespoke directive. So that's actually going to add about oh. seven new directives to the pool, um, possibly with some class feet ways to maybe sneak and grab yourself some of those if you maybe want to grab one from a different. We're trying to open up some of the, the Envoy potential there. So so as you know, Empire's Vower is cool. We are like using a lot of the feedback we're getting to make changes to these classes and really That's make wonderful. them better in the eyes of, of the players and give more options. So we're really excited about all this. And this is a process that's going to continue throughout the year. I think that's one of the most wonderful things about working here at Paizo is knowing how much the team here cares about the players and what it is that they enjoy spending time doing. So that's okay. really cool. Well, thank you very much for that spoiler. I think we're about out of time here. So I will back to the mists of the future, ah! disappearing to the void. <laughs>
survival in a world beset by magic and evil takes more than a lucky roll of the dice. Complete your Pathfinder Core Rulebook Collection with Player Core 2, an expansion on character options for the remastered Pathfinder 2nd Edition rule set. Tinker and test out formulas as an alchemist, make keen observations, and get to the heart of the matter as an investigator. Stand strong and ferocious as a barbarian. Take up a holy or unholy mantle in service of a deity as a champion. Dance through battle with the grace and bravado of a swashbuckler. Maintain a balance between mind, body, and spirit as a monk. Take hold of the innate magic in your sorcerous bloodline. Explore the mysteries of your fate as an oracle. And build even more customized characters with archetypes, ancestries, versatile heritages, and more. Welcome, friends, to the Greenwood Gala, where all the people of the forest, even talking animals like me, come together to celebrate everything wonderful about nature. We get to know each other, have fun, and respectfully share ideas. Here in the Verdurin Forest, the Treaty of the Wildwood protects nature. It lets our neighbors harvest a few trees, conserve the rest, and all in all keeps everyone peaceful, warm, and happy. This is a pleasant place, full of wonder, where everyone gets along. Uh... Wait, what's that? <laughs> well, I mean, the treaty keeps the arboreals happy, so they would never... Oh, nope, they look angry. Surely the Fae of the forest understand that... Oh, this isn't good. I can't remember the last time that... Oh, oh no! Everyone needs to hold up for a minute. We can talk this through! Wait, no, not like that! Okay, the Vergerin Forest isn't always fun and cheery, but this is getting out of control. Get some negotiators! Meet with the lumberjacks and druids! Smile a bunch! No, this is not how we're supposed to negotiate! This shouldn't be happening! We're supposed to be gathering, sharing, having fun! And now, everyone's tearing apart the treaty! Gah! Maybe... Maybe we need some new faces. Some fresh ideas. Someone who's gonna make things right. Hey, maybe some Wardens of Wildwood. In the nation of Shen Min, spirits and monsters stalk the depths of Spectrewood, and ghost towns outnumber those inhabited by living souls. But this was not always the case. Over a hundred years ago, the Age of Lost Omens began in Tian Sha, with the collapse of the mighty Lunghua Empire, an event that left the small towns of Shen Min isolated and forced their citizens to become self-sufficient or fall to ruin. Willow Shore was one such town. Founded to support the construction of a remote mountain monastery, Willow Shore soon transitioned over to a lumber town, and like so many others, it was forced to fend for itself in the years after the Empire's fall. Not two years later, the records speak of a mysterious curse that fell upon the town, and while details of what took place have been lost to time, the events of Willow Shore's season of ghosts will now be told. The season of ghosts begins during the first days of summer, and is a time when the unquiet spirits of Spectrewood grew particularly restless. The townsfolk of Willow Shore celebrate this with a night of feasting on the last day of spring, but when a group of heroes wakes the day after, they find their hometown under siege. Fog shrouds the town, and the night sky shimmers under the light of a crimson moon, and monsters now stalk freely through the town's streets. While defending the monstrous invaders and lighting the town's protective eternal lantern could restore Willow Shore to safety, these invaders and strange manifestations are only the beginning, as walls of ghostly shapes rise in the surrounding woods. The town of Willow Shore has become cursed, and its people must band together if they are to survive the coming year and the horrific monsters they will face. Can the town's newest hero save their homes, family, and themselves? Or will the season of ghosts mean the end for them all?
Hello! And welcome, Michael Sayer! Hi! Now, I'm gonna let you choose. Do you want to tell me about a game you've been playing recently, or do you want to join in the spooky season and tell me about a superstition that you like or have? Oh, gosh. Um... So, uh, I, uh, I've been playing several games, uh, recently. Uh, I've been playing the new Star Wars Outlaw, and I've been really enjoying that. Uh, that has been quite fun. I, it's, it's very stealthy, and normally, like, uh, stealth games and I have a bumpy relationship, but, uh, I think, uh, I think Outlaws does it, like, pretty well. It's fun. Uh, and my wife Morgan like decided we were going to be playing the entirety of this game. The moment she saw your little buddy, like Nix, the adorable little multi limbed, uh, definitely designed to sell plushies friend, uh, flopping about. So targeted for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun. I've been really enjoying it. That's awesome. I, that's on my list of like, Games for when I have a whole week off, I will buy it because I know that I will want to sink into it for a whole week. Um, but my first thing that I have to take a whole week off to play is Silent Hill. So we have to wait until that one's done for me. All right. Well, we're here to talk about War of Immortals, which is very exciting and right on the horizon. Although I suppose the God's Reign has happened. So in universe, the event is already... Uh, Going. Yeah, Gorum has been violently bisected, and uh, all the juicy bits inside of his armor have rained across uh, existence uh, already. That has happened. Uh, I think uh, Gen Con marked it, because there was a big organized play uh, event where uh, everybody got to see that happen. Uh, so we are... We are now uh, moving through the God's Reign and into the War of Immortals uh, proper. We are actually far enough in there with everything we've talked about and Gen Con and everything else that I kind of was like, man, what do I even talk about to like really get people ramped up that we haven't already talked about? So I just have like a giant sheet of spoilers for tonight. I was just like, I'm just going to start throwing it all out there. because I'm very off, excited. So. <laughs> uh I'll start with showing everyone in case they haven't seen it, the very cool cover art for War of Immortals. And I I'm going so to show it I had briefly. to get it from Wayne, so now it just yeah, lives back I like, here. I was like, I'm going to show it briefly so that Mike can show off the fact that he has it in the human world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but for folks, before we get into all your spoilers, for folks who maybe haven't been around for our previous few streams about it, can you give like an elevator pitch for what War of Immortals is and what's in this rule book? Yeah, so War of Immortals is a big, beefy rulebook. Uh, it is set around the death of the war god Gorum and all of these kind of events that lead up to that and that happen as a result of it. Uh, so we just jam-packed it full of all kinds of goodies. It's got two new uh, kind of like big magic, high-octane classes that are both kind of shaped by this event. It's got a bunch of new class archetypes for people who want to play different types of characters that uh, have a really good reason to care about like the battles among uh, immortals during this kind of uh, large supernatural multiplanar uh, event. It's got mythic rules for really elevating your game and taking it into the realm of folklore and uh, going kind of even further beyond the high magic that you already kind of have in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously new threats and monsters to go along with that. And a big old gazetteer that talks about the entire world of Galarian, how the God's Reign didn't just affect the inner sea, but also uh, places like Arcadia and Kazmaron and places that are outside of the normal kind of focus of our map. It really just touches everything at least a little bit. I'm so excited to read that part of the Gazetteer. And I'm going to do one of my questions before we get into all your really cool spoilers, uh, which is obviously Gorham's death is the center point of this whole event, but there's a lot of changes coming for deities as well, sort of all over Galarian and not just in the inner sea. Um, so when you were sort of outlining the book and getting all of that going, how did you sort of get through all of the gods and decide which ones were vital enough to be such a part of this event? 
Uh, so there was definitely uh, internal discussions about like which which gods get it, which gods have to stay, uh, which gods can we maim but still kind of keep. Uh, <laughs> you know, like everybody loves our gods. It's one of the reasons I think this event has been so successful because everybody kind of has their favorite god in the uh, Galarian pantheon and stuff like that. And so there were definitely times where I kept going back to. Luis and James Jacobs as our creative directors. And I was like, look, see this list of deities you've given me and how many of them you said I can do stuff to. I need this list to be this. <laughs> so pick some new ones. And, and I would throw my own deities on there. You know, I, um, I kill one of my favorite gods in spectacular fashion as part of this event. Cause I kind of feel like, if I'm going to demand that people lay sacrifices upon the altar, it is only right that I make my own sacrifice uh, in all this. Um, and some of it's the opportunity to get to do really cool stuff. Uh, War of Immortals touches a little bit on some of the new orc gods. Divine Mysteries dives even deeper. But something we've been talking about for a very long time since early in this edition cycle is that Galarian orcs, when they die a super glorious death, they get the ability to challenge deities from their pantheon, and then they throw down in a fair one-on-one -on -one fight. And if they win, they get to take that deity's place in the pantheon. Uh, and so the idea is that the orc pantheon has kind of been really stable for a long time. They've kind of had these old gods of blood and bone and violence, uh, and they've been really stable. There haven't been many orcs who've really like kind of cracked through that, but recently things have escalated in the inner sea, the whispering tyrants, you know, the, the undead ruler of this, what is essentially an undead, uh, it's not quite a nation, but it's as good as, you know, in the center of Lake and Carthen, uh, came and tried to tell the orcs, like, hey, I'm looking for foot soldiers. Y'all used to be my foot soldiers. And the orcs kind of were like, you know what? Screw this guy. Nah, we're not going to play that game anymore. Uh, and they started busting up undead. So they've had a lot more opportunities to, uh, you know, pull off amazing feats. And as they pull off those amazing feats, some of them die in the process and have claimed their blood oaths and get to go throw down so we've seen in this time of war, the orc pantheon shaking up in a way that it hasn't really in a while. And there are some new uh, orc gods who are kind of really cruel, nasty badasses. And there are some who are very heroic. And because doing something glorious and violent is not inherently good or evil necessarily, right? Uh, and so it's not just heroes who are finding their way onto the pantheon some of the new orc gods are even nastier than the ones they were supplanting so ooh, <laughs> well i can't wait to read all of that but now i'm gonna let you uh dive into all of our spoilers and i believe first up we've got some example animists yeah so with the animist uh during the play test uh, we had kind of two animist practices uh, that went into the playtest, and they they played around with proficiencies and uh, kind of like where the animist might fit on the battlefield and stuff. At the end of the day, uh, and going off of the playtest data, one of the things that we really kind of like settled on was it needs to be the apparitions who are really defining how you play and how you fight. And so what the animus practices need to do is they need to actually kind of define your relationship with these apparitions. How do you bond with them? What do they what do they mean to you personally? What is kind of like your religion? And so we actually have four animist practices uh, in the final class. Uh, and these are two of our sample characters representing the seer and the medium uh, animus practices. Um, so the seer is really about being someone who can see the spirit world, uh, who is very like kind of across the threshold in, in ways that go above and beyond even what an uh, average animist is. They, uh, they might live in dark places, they might see dark things, and because they are kind of so open to what is in the spirit world, uh, they are more likely to kind of find some of these darker spirits that uh, other animists might not find. Uh, the medium is much more focused on uh, actually having the apparition bond directly with them. They're a channel for it. Uh, their apparition will flow 
right into them and kind of like take them over. And so they're not necessarily uh, as, uh, they're not necessarily as about having whatever apparitions are in the area, like some of the other animists are where the, you know, some animists might be really interested in just like, I don't want to have one kind of focus spirit that I work with. I want to have whatever's present. Well, the medium is kind of like, I am so attuned to this spirit that, uh, it'll just run my body. It can, I can let it take me over and I can ignore a bunch of negative conditions while it just Ooh. does the things it do. Uh, so, you know, our medium here, she's got the steward of stone and fire. And so whenever she lets that thing possess her, there's just going to be a lot of flame and carnage going on. Right. And, uh, that's going to be a world she kind of lives in. That's so cool. I, uh, today, actually the first of our, um, Iconic Encounters dropped with uh, Samo sort of taking on a new uh, spirit based on where they are. So that's like the opposite of what Samo does. Yeah, because Samo is more of a yeah, jack Samo of all is, trades animist. Yeah, she uh, she's a lot more open to kind of meeting the spirits where she is and learning about her environments and kind of things like that and letting the apparitions kind of be her window into these new places in the world. She's an older character who's lived in a kind of, uh, she's been very essential to a, a large tribal government for a long time. And so this War of Immortals is kind of her first adventure out of that place. And so a lot of that is her getting to meet spirits of places that she's never seen before and just kind of get to see the world in a way that her responsibilities haven't really let her up to this point. That's so cool. And now we're going to pop over to some options for the exemplar. Yeah, so we have uh, two uh, exemplar sample builds here. The Sky King Eternal uh, and the uh, Creations Beast uh, with our Minotaur exemplar there. Uh, the Sky King Eternal, one of the abilities you're going to see in that sample build is Battle Him to the Lost. Uh, and this is kind of a cool rent the veil between worlds with your attack. And not only do you strike an enemy, but the spiritual force of you as a divine hero like cuts through their soul and through the barriers between worlds. And a bunch of other spirits will flow out from them and attack other enemies in the area and maybe even revivify allies who have fallen and are on the edge between worlds themselves when that happens. It's really big. Uh, with the Creations Beast Minotaur there, one of the things in the playtest for the Animus, or uh, the Exemplar, excuse me, uh, people really wanted it to have more options for being uh, using unarmed attacks, using fists, uh, or using gauntlets and things like that. Uh, and so he's got the Hands of the Wildling, which are one of the new icons that is really focused on giving you that kind of beefy, weaponless brawler build. And with Hands of the Icon, you can have these on gauntlets if you want to use gauntlets or if you want to use your fist or even if you have claws or other attacks like that. This is an icon will that will enhance that and uh, really kind of amplify it and allow you to do the uh, the kind of big punchy build that isn't so much about a weapon as it is about doing the kind of like Gilgamesh and Hercules style of uh, heroic deeds. For when you need to 1v1 a Hydra in the pit. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so excited for these new classes. Like every time we talk about them, I'm like soon um, because I GM our home game and I know one of my players is going to switch to an animus the moment it is available to do so. Um, I, I also wanted to say, uh, I want to give you 10 points for both times I've interviewed you on a thing. Uh, you choosing to showcase things that make me happy, Stim, because I'm so excited <laughs> about them. Because it was this and the trickster, um, which are which is also from this book. I Do believe I next up we're going to talk about some new Nephilim heritages. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that we did in this book, we kind of promised everybody there was going to be more Nephilim stuff. And so this is it. 
Uh, this brings in the Gamzi, who uh, are now folded into uh, the Nephilim heritage as their own uh, lineage. Uh, so they are going to be back and ready to go. But it's not just pickups uh, from older books. We've also got new Nephilim uh, lineages that I don't think anybody was necessarily expecting. Like our buddy here, the... Uh, do, 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 do. the battle-blooded, I wanted to make sure I had said that right, the battle-blooded Nephilim, uh, who is a Nephilim that is born of intermingling of uh, the blood or power of Valkyries or Einherjar with uh, mortals. So uh, that'll be a new option that you'll be able to uh, play if you happen to decide that you want to play a Nephilim uh, once War of Immortals drops. Uh, these are not the only lineages. There are multiple more. These are just the ones I decided to focus on. One returning, one brand new. Uh, and there's going to be a lot more. There's multiple pages of, uh, of new Nephilim feats in here. So we really blow this out because we figure War of Immortals is kind of about the impact of supernatural entities on the mortal world. And what is more an expression of supernatural impact on the mortal world than the very existence of a Nephilim, right? <laughs> I love them. I've, like, I also like really love that with the remaster, all of the like Nephilim uh, options have been made into versatile heritages. So you can be anything as a base and then add these really cool complementary Nephilim heritages to. So big, big props to y'all and the design team for that. It's really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I just, I, I love having lots of options, right? These are a little more classic, you know, we've kind of got what I'm pretty sure is an elf and a, and a human, but there's no reason they couldn't be, you know, a kobold and an orc uh, or, even a leshy for reasons that probably require a really entertaining story, right? <laughs> this is my leshy who was animated by a wizard and then accidentally had too much fun in a different plane. <laughs> um, but I think the last thing that we're showing off is for folks that don't want to play the two new classes. We've got a couple of other archetypes that uh, folks can play around with. And I know you've been, we showed off some on the blog this week. Um, we showed off the Vindicator, the Blood Rager, and there's one whose name I'm forgetting. The Avenger. Yeah. The Avenger. Um, but these are two other archetypes that are coming in the book, correct? Correct. Uh, and on the left there, you will see the iconic for the Seneschal uh class archetype which i have been being very cagey about uh and i had hinted online that i would talk about it today so uh when we decided to name this the seneschal the idea was kind of like uh denethor from lord of the rings right someone who occupies a throne while the uh the true ruler the true <laughs> monarch is gone but in this instance, this is a witch class archetype where what has happened is during this War of Immortals, your patron has died or disappeared. They are gone. But you still have the pact that you made with them. And it's just kind of attached to raw power. So you get your own kind of cool focus spell where you just kind of pull raw divine power or raw arcane power or whatever it was that was going on uh you know with your patron before and as you kind of learn to master this slightly more untamed unfiltered magic that occasionally pours through the bond that used to connect you to your patron you begin taking their place and by the end of this class archetype, when you are a 20th level uh, witch, you are a patron. You actually have your own other witches that you are channeling power to. Uh, you kind of get your own little custom bits and pieces uh, that, that you are and that you ch uh, channel outwards. And that's even part of kind of the play loop early on is you could, you know, if one of your other party members is playing a witch or a multi-class witch or something like that, you could actually decide and maybe you tell them, maybe you don't, that you are their patron and you are feeding them this power and there are things that you can do for them or that they can do for you as a result. Uh, so That's so cool. 
yeah, that is uh, that is what we've got going on there with the final class archetype from War of Immortals that we haven't really said anything uh, about yet. Now you've now you've got the whole pitch, uh, and then next to the Seneschal there is our Warrior of Legend. Uh, this is a fighter class archetype, and the fighter is kind of like the definitional heroic but kind of bog standard class, right? He's the guy in armor who tanks or who just messes the enemy up, but he doesn't have a, a particular hook into something like the War of Immortals, where the Warrior of Legend, uh, the core inspiration for this was like Achilles, uh, right? And those similar kind of ideas. Uh and you are uh, a character who has a doom, a curse that is upon you. There is a particular type of damage uh, that you have a weakness to. And as you go up in levels and you learn more about yourself and your, uh, your you know, kind of like what your curse is and what your glory is, you will dial in a little bit more tightly on... Uh, what you are weak to, like starting out, it's like you might be weak to piercing damage, which is going to suck because a lot of things do piercing damage. Yeah. Uh, and then later on, it's going to be like, oh, my doom is an arrow. At some point, I'm going to catch an arrow and that will be the end of me. Uh, so now it's gotten really specific. And in exchange for this curse, you also are getting like really significant powers. Uh, you don't use heavy armor like a fighter does. You don't get the free shield block. You're really focused on spears and pole arms as part of your thing. You get die hard, so you're harder to kill. But also when you take damage from your cursed weakness, you get the doomed condition. And while you are doomed, it you are closer to death but it opens up kind of other heroic abilities. You'll have like a heroic defiance where you get the doomed condition, but because your doom has come upon you, you also fight harder than you would. So you get temp HP and bonuses to your saves. Uh, you get stances and things where you can uh, lash out. Uh, and their 14th level archetype feat is actually called Only My Doom May Claim Me. Uh, where they basically get resistance to everything except their cursed weakness. So, uh, and it's pretty significant resistance. So they're uh, they're a uh, they're a very cool kind of high risk, high reward uh, take on the fighter concept, uh, and they fit really well in the kind of general uh, high fantasy folkloric stories that we're looking to enable with this book. Awesome. Well. Thank you so much for running us through all of these. I'm very excited and everyone in the chat is too. Um, and we will see you again very shortly after our last little break when we come back for a Q&A. So folks in the chat, remember, put your questions there and we will be grabbing them when we come back from these next couple of breaks. See you then. Thank you. You've made names for yourselves as adventurers over the years, yet now it seems adventure has found you instead. Mysterious and magical harrow cards have appeared among your belongings. Where did they come from? And what of the strange powers they grant? The Brass Dwarf protects you from fire and other harmful effects. The Empty Throne overwhelms your foes with hopelessness and despair. The Paladin defends you from harm and protects you from peril. And the Rabbit Prince lets you strike at foes with great accuracy. But be careful his advice doesn't shatter your blade. There are so many more cards out there to be found. They've been scattered across the world, so now the hunt is on. With each card you gather, your power grows. Before long, you will use this power to travel to places beyond reality itself. Yet still, the question remains. Where have these cards come from? Who could have created them? And for what purpose? And what of the fiendish armies and monstrous foes who gather against you and seek the cards for themselves? You race against time, gathering these treasures before they're used against you. Will your quest lead you to legendary realms and grant the destiny you deserve? Or are you merely pawns, unwittingly serving mysterious forces who watch from afar? waiting for the right time to pluck your futures away. In the end, 
What chance do adventurers have against those who would steal fate itself? In 316 AG, the Galactic Explorers League known as the Starfinder Society lost over 80% of its membership during a mission into the region of space known as the Scoured Stars. Following the mission, a golden barrier encompassed the distant trinary star system and contact has been cut off ever since. You and your friends are recently graduated Starfinders, finding yourselves in a galaxy where the society's future rests in your hands. Or whatever appropriate alien appendages you possess. It's up to you to rebuild the fractured Starfinder society, make allies at home and in distant regions of space, fend off new and ancient threats alike, and eventually solve the mystery of the Scoured Stars! All in a day's work for a Starfinder. The Scoured Stars is a 260-page hardback epic adventure that takes your Starfinder characters from 1st to 15th level, containing 12 distinct adventures. This science fantasy campaign has the players take center stage as a new generation of Starfinder, working to uncover the secrets of the region of space known as the Scoured Stars. Along the way, you'll travel across the cosmos in your starship, make first contact with alien species, encounter emerging galactic threats, explore ancient ruins, and build a coalition of powerful allies to tackle whatever the Scoured Stars has to throw at you. everyone Ooh. and welcome back <laughs> long time no see for everyone except for mike who i just bothered two minutes ago <laughs> but now we're here for our q a so bj and i will pop back and forth grabbing some questions from our question document and remember you can still add them throughout so like if someone answers a question here that pops your brain a new one go ahead and put it in the chat and our wonderful moderator alex will grab it for you um I'm going to start with a question for James. I'm currently running three player characters through Abomination Vaults. I threw an extra level onto them to start. Are there any tips or tricks for taking those three into Curtain Call, who would be a level higher to begin with? I would suggest there's a section in Game GM Core and Game Master Guide. Uh, you can check those books out uh, for advice on running games for you know fewer or greater numbers of player characters. Um, if they're coming in at a higher level, then um, to a certain extent, that's going to kind of a little bit balance out the fact that they're going to be tackling things that are basically built for a group of four players. Um, so whenever you're doing something like that, my my best advice, uh, my personal preference is to just play the game as it is and then just keep an eye on how things are going. Uh, talk with your players after every session to see how they are enjoying the game and things things are going. If things are too tough or, or not tough enough, you can make adjustments as you go. And uh, being open and, and letting your players know that you're open to making changes and adjustments as you go is really important for that sort of thing. Thank you. So I have a question here that says, does Exemplar still have some healing options? I know it had a few in the play test. Uh, yeah, they uh, they do. They, they have uh, a lot of kind of personal heroic stuff that allows it, them to heal themselves and be really hard to put down. And they have a couple cool kind of like I do a big AOE explosion and some of my allies who are also in the area of that explosion get some healing and things like that. Uh, they they're not really like cleric healing where they're doing a very hyper kind of specific thing. They're all about doing big heroic flashy action stuff. And so they do have some healing, but it's all kind of wrapped up in, in meeting those kind of stories and themes. Thank 
you. I'm sorry, Mike. A lot of these questions are going to be for you. So I'm just going to keep uh, <laughs> tossing them at you. Uh, In for a Cracker asks, will the Animus be able to have an impersonal or personal relationship with their apparition still? One that constantly like is changing? Yeah, uh, so like I was talking about, we have four different animus practices, and uh, those really define the way that you interact with your spirits. They're they're kind of like the foundation of your personal religion, right? And so some of them, uh, because we had a lot of requests for that in the playtest, are really focused on there is maybe one apparition that I always kind of have and I never really let it go. And it's kind of the core of all of my, uh, my, my kind of personal beliefs and, and the things that I do. And some of them are like, really just a lot more about whatever's here in the moment. Not only might I have different ones every day, I might swap some of them out right in the middle of the fight because they're not doing it for me. And, uh, and I have just kind of a lot more, uh, kind of personal views and investments on what my relationship with these spirits is. They are, they are less my friends and more uh, my tools. That is certainly a build you can do. <laughs> I'm less my friends and more the roommates that I'm using their various uh, car yeah, you, just, and you just are the room and pot. also the roommate whose name is on the lease. So. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, so it looks like we have a Starfinder question here. What excites you most about the upcoming playtest scenarios and what they might bring to the playtest for feedback? Oh, yes. Uh, well, we have Wheel of Monsters coming up by Dustin Knight. What is that? Um, <laughs> wheel of it, Monsters! I mean, it's what's on the tin. There's a wheel, and then that generates monsters for you. It might involve a certain undead celebrity named Zoe, and it might, you know, involve <laughs> some, some, you know, some hijinks. Honestly, uh, it was kind of one of the immediate thoughts we had for playtesting was, eh, well, we should just do like a little bit of a grinder fight and see how people go not in the traditional sense of fight till they're 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 completely destroyed but like here's a here's a slightly um higher level playtest that allows us to dive into different monster types and let people experience those encounters i think dustin did a really good job um then we have a, a 15th level adventure coming out um from uh jenny jerzabski that'll be oh gosh next month that'll be part of that release uh release schedule and that will be kind of the higher level i don't want to get into too many specifics on that one just yet, but um that'll be a bit of a higher level more of a traditional all-around adventure with uh some some yeah some some tests at the higher levels of play so those are all really exciting as far as you know scenario releases and content uh, obviously empires devoured that we talked about it kind of bridges a gap we have just as i mentioned based off the play testing data we were even doing today in our meetings it, it'll be nice to have content for people to play at those higher levels so we can see some of those higher levels come through very cool um this question opens with if any more spoilers are fine. So I guess if the answer to that part is no, Mike, you can tell me to be quiet now. <laughs> um, I'm a little curious if the exemplar still has only light armor or if they can also get higher tiers of armor, like medium or heavy. Yeah, they can get medium. I'll tell you that. I don't. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they can get that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, what can we expect regarding class adjustments of Pathfinder classes in Starfinder? Oh, yeah. Um, so at first, not not a ton. We're not we're not quite there where we want to, you know, give give changes on how. But what we will do is um, in our GM book that will be you know coming out next year, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, in in some of our content. How do you run a mixed table? What does that look like? What sorts of changes might you need to do? Uh, what if you want to take one of these cool Starfinder classes and run them in Pathfinder? We're not going to focus as much on that, but we'll, we'll have some, you know, some common pitfalls and whatnot to look out for. Things like, well, if you have a Starfinder class in Pathfinder, make sure they can get batteries. That seems important. <laughs> yeah. Or, hey, this spell... Oh, uh, no. oh. As, as Mike is well aware, you don't got a cell phone. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> in space, as we found out in our playtest. I'm slowly are, bleeding to death, and I can't get the ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't get the motivating ringtone spell because apparently the gunslinger doesn't come pre-equipped with a cell phone. He doesn't have uh, a cell phone. <laughs> I know. So yeah, that that's the type of stuff we're going to be talking a bit about in our in our GM book and sort of going into some details on that. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a whole section uh, that. Dustin Knight's been working on uh, called just anachronistic adventures. That's going to talk a little about a bit mixing the stream, so to speak. But a lot of that is going to be more um, advice. I think, you know, there's some really cool potential in the future. If we wanted to say, Hey, let's do a book where maybe we give some fighter feats in Starfinder, or conversely, Hey, maybe there's a chance Pathfinder wants to give some Pathfinder flavored stuff for the mystic. Those are all things we'll be able to do in this new, um, this new dynamic. So it's really exciting. I would like to give a warm welcome to your little void who has walked into oh, your yeah. background. Yeah, that's <laughs> Kuro. She comes, she goes, she does what she wants. <laughs> I also have a void, but she's locked in her princess tower while I work or else there. she oh. would be a monster. <laughs> um, I'm going to self-indulgently um, ask the, uh, quote unquote from this document non-specific request for more information about the actors um, I will bring back the image from before so that folks who weren't here can see them these are the actors in Curtain Call um, these are the eight that I wrote uh, each of them embodies one aspect and is really really bad at a different aspect and so if you Spend all your time talking to Yerix, who is uh, the monkey goblin that you see the second portrait, um, and decide that you want Yerix to play you, but Yerix has the opposite archetype that you should be. Um, you might you might find that he gets lower reviews than you might like, um, and that's kind of how that uh, system is designed to work. Um, but yes, these are the actors that you can choose to play your player characters um, in the opera of Curtain Call, and I will let James chime in if there's anything else he wants to say about the actors who are not your player characters. Um. Not much. I one of the things that I really loved about this adventure path is uh, since there's less fighting and more more chatting, uh, we have more of these kind of portrait artwork uh, throughout the adventure path, which is really really cool because uh, we can they take up less room, so we can get more of them in there. So uh, these are the eight actors, but we've also got illustrations of like the people that you have to go uh, get to sponsor. You know, the people that are paying for the thing. Uh, uh, illustrations of um the costumers the uh i don't think we got illustrations of the the composers but we got three different composers that you can choose from um yeah there's just a lot of different fun elements like i just remembered uh, for operas you can go for like a dramatic opera or a comedic opera or just all out just kind of bonkers spectacular special effects opera so Depending upon which choice you choose there, different composers might be better at it. You don't want to hire like uh, Hans Zimmer to do your your creepy, uh, you know, your little, uh, your, your romantic comedy, you know. I'm hiring John Carpenter to do my romantic comedy, actually. <laughs> that's that's, that's the uh, exception. You can hire John Carpenter for anything and he'll do awesome at everything. There you go. There you go. Um, looks like Sir Newt wants to know how difficult was extending the mathematical framework of the game to accommodate mythic rules. Oh, it was a humongous pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, no, it was. Uh, it was immensely. We tried multiple different things. Poor, poor James was like, "Hey, when can I look at those mythic rules?" And I was like, "When I'm goddamn done, James. When I'm done." <laughs> Which, which is a side effect is why you're not seeing Mythic Adventures uh, this year. Yeah, uh, I ah. am very happy ultimately with uh, where we ended up. I think we found a really cool thing that covers the full arc of the game and gives a really kind of like great experience uh, that allows Pathfinder 2nd Edition to still be all of the things it kind of famously is, like well-balanced and engaging and good for all the players at the table. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was not... It, it, it may have legitimately been the most difficult design undertaking we've we've tackled since like originally designing the system. 
Oof. <laughs> Um, I think we're just about out of time for our show today, unless any of our guests have anything they wanted to bring up and didn't get a chance to during their segments. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh, I may I may have misspoken. Is there a question that someone has for Thirsty? Uh oh. What? I have a question for Thirsty, but oh, I don't yeah. know if I'm allowed to ask it. So oh, no. I tried to ask it in a private chat right. instead. All right, lay it on me. I just want to know if you happen to know what the motivation was behind the drift caliper swarms. Oh, because califors are terrifying. <laughs> like, like, you know, like blowflies, bot flies, all those. Are, those are, they're, they're horrifying. Well, so I'm like, here in the book, I don't know if we're yeah, allowed yeah, to yeah, show yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah, my grandpa thinks these are Minecraft flies. <laughs> Yeah, they are. 100%. And we would like to know if that was the inspiration behind them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, like, I, I, when I write things, I love nightmare fuel. And um, I'm like, wow, what if you had these, like, these flies that could, like, you know, you know, typically buzz and infest you with awful things. What if they could phase through reality so they could just like, oh I don't God. know, also That's do horrifying. it inside you? Yep. You That's asked horrifying. the question. That's there just horrifying. There it is. There it is. I now will have nightmares about being invaded by vicious, horrific Minecraft looking flies. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Pixie. That's perfect closure love, for Friday. Tapping the, the block, but it's coming from inside your body. <laughs> 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 We've gone full circle from Mike making me happy stim to thirsty making me unhappy stim. And I think that's a wonderful way to end. Um, happy Friday the 13th, yeah. Yay. So as we uh, close out, uh, let's let our guests tell you who they are and where you can find them if you want to on the internet. Let's start with James. Ah, um, so I'm sorry. James I'm the narrative creator director for uh, Pathfinder. Uh, you can usually find me lurking around the message boards at paizo.com and uh, i'm also over on uh, reddit uh, in the pathfinder forums there and um that's about it i'm otherwise a social media hermit and i live in the i would like to live in the woods in the tower and maybe become a masked uh, slasher if these darn kids don't stop <laughs> bugging me because it's friday the 13th <laughs> thirsty Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Thurston Hillman. I am the associate publisher here at Paizo. Uh, you can find me on all the social media stuff uh, at on call GM. Uh, you can also see me GM over on Narrative Declaration. I do a bunch of stuff. Um, hi, you're all great. Thanks for your playtest feedback. Have a good weekend. Next person. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm Michael Sayre. I'm the director of rules and lore here at Paizo. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, under at Michael J. Sayre one, and you can find me on blue sky under at animist gunslinger. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm, I'm usually on the Paizo forums at least every so often. <laughs> Uh, and I have been Rue. Uh, you can find me most places on the internet as Ilana Knight and on the site formerly known as Twitter as Ilana Knight 13 because I made a Twitter when I was 12, lost the password, and now I can't get my username back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fair. Well, I'm BJ, and you can find me on most socials just as BJ Hensley. There's the occasional BJ Hensley one or two, but probably my picture has something with cat ears in it. It's pretty easy to locate. I'm friendly to approach. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody next time. It was great to hang out with the Pathfinders and Starfinders and learn a little bit as I went. And be sure to mark your calendars for our next Paizo Live, which will be Friday, October 4th. Same goblin time, same skittermander place. Until then, if you want to get more updates on what's happening at Paizo, you can check out our blog and forums, or you can follow our newsletter by joining at paizo.com slash news. Thank you all very much, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your spooky Friday the 13th weekend. Bye, all. Bye. <laughs>